Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to The Attic. As many of you know, I like to interview fellow Jehovah's Witnesses on this channel. Today, I am delighted to welcome to the channel someone with whom I have more than one shared experience. David De Winter, thank you so much for joining me. Hi Lloyd, thank you for, um, for having me on tonight. Much appreciated. It's an absolute pleasure. So um, David and I are connected via Twitter, and I've heard a bit of your story, and what I read was truly heart-wrenching. You've been through an awful lot lately, um, so obviously feel free to share or not share according to what you feel comfortable with, but I think it's safe to say that you have suffered a big loss recently. Yes, that's right. Um, my mother... Um... Had can was diagnosed with cancer uh, in April, um, <clears throat> and unfortunately, it was uh, progressed uh, terminal. Um, so at the time, uh, we didn't know how long she had. Um, she didn't wish to know actually her and my my father, but obviously, in the background, I think I needed to find out just to make sure we could get some care into place. Um, so, so we discovered a few months. I think at the time, in my mind, um, it was April time. So I kind of felt maybe we can get to September, um, October. You kind of had this vague idea in your mind. Um, it was really a race just to get her out of hospital to do home care, um, which are the members of the family um, predominantly took over with. Um, and unfortunately, yeah, she died um, in late June. Um, and it was quite sort of a... I suppose quite a shock in terms of the deterioration, how rapid it was, um, particularly for the last um, few weeks. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it was it was quite traumatic. I think just dealing with the, the actual cancer and seeing a loved one um, deteriorate so so rapidly. Yeah. Um, we had a lot of help, obviously, from Mary Curie and, and and great people like that, and district nurses who were coming to the home, but it was predominantly with us. Um, so we found that very very difficult uh, obviously she was devout uh, Jehovah's Witness and uh, so she she was uh, I think around 73 74 um obviously we don't we don't celebrate birthdays so it's quite hard to to gauge hard to keep track when you don't celebrate birthdays isn't yeah, it? yeah exactly yeah. so so when I um so for me it's quite a normal thing to be doing I left years ago but uh, it's quite hard to track even date of birth and things like that to, to resolve that um, so yeah, she she'd been brought up in it since she was nine years old as as a witness. Uh, my father was uh, an elder for many years, and uh, he still is. He's he's sort of mid eighties, um, probably not cognitively quite where he was at in prior years. But um, I th I think probably the trauma of, of losing a loved one. I, I know you've you've been through that yourself. I, I watched actually um, the video you did the twenty year anniversary of your own mum's death so I could really relate to that quite strongly um and that was traumatic enough but for me I haven't left um the children's witnesses quite a young age I left when I was around uh, 15 16 um so I've, I've been out of that world an awful long time um I found myself really plunged straight into the what felt the heart of it um uh during her her last months, I would say, um, there were an awful lot of witnesses calling at the house. Um, it, it became a conveyor belt for the last sort of week or so, and they were witnessing to me quite regularly at her bedside, which I found. Um, I think I was Extremely more shocked. inappropriate. Yeah. 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 Completely. And um, I suppose in their world, it's not because they're. It's the ends justify their means that they're trying to save. A life um but to me yeah it was it was a shock and the strange thing was i said to my wife um who's, who's a big watcher of your show by the way years ago so she she kind of put me on to um that i i kind of envisaged this kind of thing might well happen when the time came when my parents passed um but i think seeing it but actually living it was, was two very different things um mm. so yeah it was it was completely inappropriate really um and then the funeral itself became such a strange experience. Um, I, I want to kind of tackle the funeral um, 
kind of separately and, and first kind of process some of what you've you've just said. So like you say, I, I can definitely relate. Um what I what I didn't like to hear when when my mother died was people saying, I know how you feel. Um perhaps because their mother had died or their par- one of their parents had died, usually at a completely different age or when they were at a completely different age. But even if the ages were the same, I was 21 and my mother was 53. Even if the ages were the same, no two people are the same. No. And, no. And, and no relationships are the same. So no one can truly say, in my opinion, I know how you feel. I think that's a really uh, thoughtless thing to say, and I would always avoid saying that to someone in your situation. But I I certainly do uh, empathise, having been through a a very similar situation. As you say, um, my mother received um, uh, the news that she might expect, I think, two months. And so devastating as that news was, you think, well, that's two months, you know, we've got to make the most out of this two months. And I think it was two or three weeks before she died. So and, and it's a similar story with you. You were you were given this period and it ended up being half of that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and of course, during that period, you're very, very limited, um, both in terms of I mean, I don't know what your mother's medical condition was in terms of her deterioration, but the, the the cancer itself will typically make it hard to communicate as yeah. things um, near their end, and yeah. and for the whole uh, traumatic experience to be exacerbated by Jehovah's Witnesses um, circling like vultures and trying to exploit the situation as an opportunity to recruit you into the organization is just despicable so yeah. i just wanted to yeah. say that yeah yeah thank you yeah and it is um yeah it's it's i suppose that there was an element of, of shock um i mean you've got i, I sort of tried to see humorous points in it my wife has, has never had anything to do with Jehovah's Witnesses, and, he, and even though I'd maintained a relationship with my parents, the witnessing was kind of in the background. It, my mum would witness far more, um, but had laid off. But but my wife had never. When you say your mother would witness far more, do you mean to you? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. there would be um, typically. I, I think probably the best example would be when uh, the pandemic, COVID started. Um, I did actually do some homework to see what they might be being taught. Um, about that just to be forearmed I guess forewarned um so so typically she was you know very keen on that um I I think she was diligent she she absolutely believed it um 100 percent the the witnessing and all the beliefs um but I always struggle to get her head around my decision I I think to to have left um I I think I was very naive in retrospect thinking that once I'd left that was kind of it because um I think at the point I, I left we, this was sort of in the in the 90s really with you know the internet didn't exist um so there were no stories of other witnesses really that I could get a hold of um or, or find out how other people coped so exit strategies I, I didn't have anything I just sort of thought I can't do this I can't cope um and left very quickly so it wasn't necessarily um you you taking a stand against the religion on conscientious grounds it was would you say <clears throat> emotionally um you know the religion wasn't a good fit for you yeah yeah exactly that and and yeah even though i've been raised in it i never i never felt sort of right really um i've got very vivid memories i used to have a lot of um we're sort of i'm sorry if i'm digressing a little no, bit don't, but, go ahead okay as a kid growing up i used to be physically sick every weekend. I used to get these terrible stomach pains. And um, so I my mum used to take me to the doctors a lot and we'd try and find out what's going on. So I remember the doctors would say things like, Are you being bullied at school? Is it this? Is it that? And I used to think, why are they why? But it's only obviously as I, I was much older and left, I thought, yeah, I was suffering with extreme anxiety really. Um and I can remember being probably about 12, 13, thinking, why am I 
so unwell and why am I so unhappy um, at certain points? Because I, I quite enjoyed my time with my worldly friends. We played a lot of football and that kind of thing. And it was, I can remember sitting on my bed one day and I was thinking, what is it? What, what's wrong? And I remember thinking about the Kingdom Hall, the meetings and my stomach turning. And I remember sort of on a Monday, if we were in school, we're going to play football later or cricket, whatever we're doing. I'd be excited. Tuesday, my stomach would turn because we had the group meetings that night. Thursday, the same would happen. Saturday, we're knocking the doors. Sunday, you know, uh, morning meetings again and then field service. So I, I knew very young it's this. Um, I think I was extremely fortunate in that I, I had two brothers. So I won't go into too much detail on those. Mm. But one, one was in the proceeds of leaving. It was an extremely volatile um, environment and situation and I what I did I just sort of observed what was going on and thought when I leave I'm not going to do it that way so so I suppose maybe I did have an exit strategy it was to quietly drift um but I had nothing in terms of how am I going to get a home how am I going to pay for myself um so yeah so I knew really young so I guess that that's where my my naivety's been because I was probably disengaged as as 12 13 year old uh left when i was around 15 16 did you ever get baptized no no ah, um okay yeah so that, that made life a little easier mm. and i suppose i was um i left pretty much as a minor so it's very difficult for my parents to kick me out yeah. essentially yeah. um which was maybe part of the plan at the time um so no, I, I never got baptized. That was a huge source of difficulty because my father was was an elder. He was extremely well respected in the congregation. Uh, he's a very affable chap, I guess is the only way to put it. So lots of people were always coming back and forth to the house um, to see him with, with different problems. Um, so for them, it was a huge sense of shame, I guess, that I was going to be leaving. Was he an elder at the time that you left? Yeah. Or was it yeah. right? Because sometimes yeah. that can cause problems for the um, appointment of an elder <clears throat> or for their position as an elder if yeah, the he, family is is not falling in lockstep. Yeah. Yeah, I think it put them under extreme um, pressure. And, and mm. the, I had an older brother who who left as well, so that was two two notches against the the family, if you like, in that respect. Um, but yes, it was it was difficult. But um, yeah, I, I wasn't combative. I didn't sort of argue. I wouldn't really let them um, get into arguments. And I, I think I prepped really well all the, all the things that they would likely be saying. I obviously had lots of elders uh, visiting and shepherding calls and uh, all that kind of thing. Which again, when I look back now, it's um, you know I'm 15 and sat there. I can remember vividly three elders coming at once with their suitcase and um, suitcases each and their Bibles. And it was a real sort of campaign um, to lean on me. When that didn't work, they did send another. Um, and he was a keen footballer once upon a time and um, a big football fan, which which I was. So I think they thought that's the angle, if we can try some familiarity on that one. But, um, yeah, it was a no-go. Um they really trouble. don't like football, by the way, David. I don't know to what extent you kept <laughs> kept well, your that... finger on the on on this, but uh, they've released quite a lot of video propaganda oh, really? against against football. Uh, wow. That that seems to be the sport that they really, really don't like. Yeah, that's incredible. That's yeah. Um, is that because of the worldly exposure? I'm guessing. Is it if um um that well they've for example they released um a testimonial by I think a Ukrainian um footballer who uh, became a Jehovah's Witness and was um bemoaning the the trappings of, of being a professional footballer and um yeah there's been several videos where rather than it being about cricket or basketball or baseball um football seems to be the the sport of choice for them to single out as being um you know, leading to people being overly competitive and potentially leading to a, a career that could lead one astray. So, yeah, it's what it was. Maybe, I mean, maybe that was start of the, the problems for me because mm. I was playing a lot of football and I, I just signed for the local town team, which caused huge 
ruptions and problems. Like because we used to play congregation football after you know a barbecue or whatever, and we do it Sunday evenings in the summer. But I, I can remember one brother pulling me over and sort of saying, "You've signed for for your local team and all that. It's not going to be like congregation football, you know, where you can just." run rings around people and blah 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 plus you have the worldly influence and and yeah they were really sort of coming down on that um back then to the point i, I did have an ultimatum in the end that i would i'd be allowed to play for the local team as long as i continued um or took up the studies again because i was clearly drifting i mean the sorry did the elders give you this ultimatum uh no that was that was within the family within um, the family okay so as a typical teenager i i was extremely stubborn I, I was very angry in a, in a refrained way um so I thought well I won't I won't go to the meetings and I won't play football I won't I won't do any of it I'll whatever it takes I'll have my freedom sort of thing um so that's what I had to do but um so yeah so I mean I stepped away at such a, a young age really 15 16 um never baptized as, as you mentioned and that I, I suppose they couldn't um completely ignore me so it, I think it maybe took the pressure off my parents slightly in terms of um, I hadn't been disfellowshipped so they couldn't um, do anything there but obviously um, I, I things did kick off so there were little rumours I remember um, I had a friend the same age uh, and after I'd left he, he was in the congregation we, we met up to play football we had sort of a, a crossover of friends that were not part of the religion uh, and I remember him turning up saw me and turned away and walked off and I sort of remember sprinting up you know after him to sort of say what's what's wrong and he said well my, my parents said I'm not allowed to you know play with you anymore or be around you um because you've left and can I, I just said, ask how old how old was were you and him when this conversation happened uh we must have been 15 tipping into to sort of 16 um 15 16 year old saying my mum and dad say i can't play with you it, it's just you know it's the sort of conversation you'd expect you know from a uh, from an eight or nine year old you yeah. know but yeah that, that's crazy isn't it yeah you know? and it was sheer panic mm. uh from him mm. i could see that and actually i was able to reason with him about it and i said it's still me well i'm not gonna mm. i'm not gonna eat you i'm not gonna nothing's really changed i just have a different uh opinion Mm. Um, so he so he did settle down. He, I think he actually left. Well, he did leave um, himself mm. uh, a few years later. Um, but uh, he'd been told that I was um, taking drugs and into worldly things now, um, which conjured up those illustrations they used to have in Watchtowers and youth books where anyone in the world is drinking, smoking, and behaving like animals. So I'd become... I think rumours went round when I left that I, that I was gay. <laughs> Right, <laughs> that's, that's what I've heard. Uh, yeah, that's what I heard after the fact that that was the rumor that was doing the rounds. So yeah, um, yeah. It's, yeah. And I guess it helps their cause, doesn't it? Because if it's propaganda, if you leave, then you're um, clearly you've fallen into evil sort of habits or ways. Mm. Um, not mm. that being engaged remotely uh, evil. Um, so yeah, yeah. it was. I, uh, it was just crazy. So I, I actually left. You know, I left the town. I left home. Um, couple of years later so I think I was around 18 at that point and and sort of left a lot of it behind um I obviously took a lot of damage with me I think and then various traumas um very confused about uh my own family and how they felt about me and and I them um didn't really have much contact with my parents for I'd say a good five to ten years um and then that softened um, around sort of 2009, I'd say. Um, started up the contact again. I think they could see I wasn't all bad, my parents, and um, we managed to have a relationship um, to the point I've been doing an awful lot of care for them over the last sort of two, three years, particularly with, with age setting in and, and various health complaints from them both. Um, so, so did a lot of that. I'm not sure how that would have worked their end with their congregation, and that's something I take some solace in, particularly with the confusion I felt since the funeral. Um, so, I think it must have been a strain for them to to do that. But I suspect there was a briefing that maybe one day I'll I'll sort of come back, um, and then it's still in my my mind. Um, 
obviously that that confusion then has just exploded really during that Does, is, is that in itself um a cause of uh, distress for you that um that your mother will have died uh, wanting you to join the religion yeah yeah and i found that yeah extremely upsetting um it hurt a lot because i to me it's not intentional on her behalf and I'm, i suppose my anger is very much at the organization that makes people feel that way really that, that there is no alternative to a happy life um so yeah she was going to die unhappy was the impression when she could speak um because i was not going to to come back um <clears throat> so yeah i had a shock uh, it was the week before she died um she had a bad night she was on a lot of morphine by this point um and uh, joe's with his family that were there as soon as i'd arrived on the saturday they were sort of saying she had a terrible night but she'd been talking about me all night um and about we must tell him about the truth and get him back to the truth and and it, yeah it was such a strange feeling because it's uh, grief for her i suppose i was going through a huge amount of grief anyway um watching what was happening to her but also this sort of i do know who i am really um i've led a, 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 a fairly happy life for, for 30 years um and it's all sort of gone negated you know it's mm. it's it, it's not in her mind so I wondered yeah they obviously didn't know who I am I don't think at all um and then that that feeling got worse as the week went on she lost speech I'd say probably two days later so I went to see her again the next day because you're in this world if you're not knowing is it today is it tomorrow it was difficult to tell um the last thing she could say to us was the following day uh, and that was to me, my wife. I just bought, we, we had a baby last year, so she's coming up to a one-year-old uh, this month. Um, so I was desperate for her to, to see her one last time. But she said she'd done us letters and please look into the truth. Um, and it was very mumbled and murmured. And then that was it. That was the last sort of conversation I've had, which was her pleading to me to look into it again. Um, so that that sort of... <clears throat> does play in my mind quite a lot. Well, for those to be her last words to you, yeah, that yeah. that's going to, you know, be a source of considerable um, trauma. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's yeah, it hurts um, considerably in the moment. Um, mm. And I think what made that infinitely worse again, I, I remember going down on the. I, I honestly thought she would have passed by around Tuesday. It's awful, isn't it? But you start sort of thinking preparing yourself when is this gonna happen so I, I was obviously going down every day um to see her it was about a <clears throat> 45 minute drive to get to get there um and then on the wednesday my other brother i have two brothers he, he's still very much part of the religion he sort of said i said i'm amazed she's still sort of here really um and then he said and a couple of them had already said this that i think she's waiting for you to tell her you'll come back, you know, or say something to her uh, to put her in. So, so again, it was just, you know, we're here again. Um, so I said, I can't. I said, ironically, Steve, I, I do tell the truth. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, I can't, I can't lie to her like that. So <clears throat> I did go and sit with her. I don't know if she could could hear me, but but I did sort of say that, you know, I don't know what happens to us when we die. I think that's part of the mystery and beauty of life. But wherever it is, I'm sure I'll I'll see you there, sort of thing. Um, and and that's the best I could um, give her, really. Um, I I honestly don't think she could hear anything but that that stage. Um, and that that's again one of the most distressing things in that situation because you you like to think when. Um, when again you, you you get this news that your loved one is dying, you like to think that there'll there'll come a moment when you'll get to actually say goodbye, and no one can actually prepare you for when you actually don't get that opportunity. Yeah, because yeah. Um, due to pain medication, or in my case, you know, my mother uh, became increasingly confused as the cancer worked its way through her body and, and into her brain and that kind of thing. Um, 
before you know it, you, you don't even have the chance to say goodbye. Yeah. Um, so I, I, again, I, I do empathize. Um, and I, I want to, if I may ask you about the funeral, um, just uh, I, I'm also interested, though, in, you know, where your head was at kind of theologically. Um, do you mind me asking how old you are? Of course, yeah, I'm uh, 44. OK, uh, 44. So just a couple of years older than me. So between the ages of um, 15, 16 and 44, would you say that you were able to um, research objectively the Jehovah's Witness religion and thereby gain a level of closure between yourself and, you know, the more abusive and misleading aspects of the religion? Or were you, you know, mostly, you know, ignorant to um, the more nefarious elements of the religion over that period? So I think um, that there were a few years once I'd, I'd gotten out um, of, of just trying to adapt um, to the, the big, scary world, um, thinking there were going to be drunks and drug addicts on every corner and, you know, doing terrible things. Um, so, so once I'd kind of adapted to, to that and, and actually leaving home so early and, and whatever else, yeah, I started to then look objectively at thing. And I suppose I've, I've done that periodically over, over the years. Um, so Raymond Franz, um, his book, I, I mean, that was years ago that I'd, I'd read that. Um, so I remember looking into that and just being intrigued by the principle of this governing body, um, which is, you know, just, just eight chaps sat around um, coming up with uh, absolutely mind boggling laws that, that dictate people's lives entirely. Um, I, I was extremely uncomfortable. And I think hearing firsthand uh, of, of Raymond's experiences as a governing body member or what was going on within that governing body, that that caused me, uh, not, not problems, but I think it opened my eyes in terms of, yeah, that's 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 not right. Um, and and one roughly how I, old were you when you read uh, Crisis yeah. of Conscience? I think I must have been around, so we're going back 20 plus years. So, so I would have been early to mid um, 20s. Um, okay. So you, you haven't, from from your early 20s to now it's not like you've been fearing an imminent armageddon and being killed at armageddon no no right um so no i i, I was completely awash of it if i mean going back to when those those elders were calling around um and visiting as a young kid i guess at the time because the, the, the pressure they were applying i i remember really upsetting my mum that with the elders i knew that line would work extremely well but but actually and, and it was truthful for, for me, the fundamental truth was, which is a crippling one really for a kid looking back. So I thought even if, if Jehovah is real, uh, all of these things are real, I find him so cruel and I find what's expected of us so um, restrictive that I would rather die now than live another moment doing this. I, I can remember saying that to my mum because she's quite frustrated I'd left and quite frustrated, it's an understatement. But I remember saying, why, why can't you, um, how could you not want to live in a paradise on earth? And I'm, I'm probably in a bit of a childish way, but but to the point, um, I remember saying, well, there'll be no football there. There'll be none of the music that I'm passionate about. Uh, all the things that I want to do, I won't be able to do there. So I would rather die now than live another day. You mean you don't like frolicking with pandas? <laughs> no, I thought everyone I wanted to very, do that. Was, no, yeah, I know. I've, I've been waiting for them to come out with the, the trees there and <laughs> sort of uh, forcing themselves upon me. But um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, the the, the, the idea, and, and to me that was very real. That if if because I had I still had this fear of of Jehovah. I still had this bizarre fear going on. Um, that it might be real, but I thought even if it is, I can't. I can't actually do this. Um, which was the trump card for the elders when they when they visited, because you know they, they had the Bibles out. They were going through different scriptures and, and and trying to sort of persuade me back. But that was the bottom line. I thought I can't. Mm. I can't do this. Um, you might as well kill me now if this is it. Um, mm. So yeah. So so I, I didn't have that concern in later life anyway. I think that evolved into. I simply don't believe it because it seemed um, more and more ridiculous 
as time went on. Now, um, to go back to my wife, because she was watching um, some of your things a, a few years back. Um, I think the three apostates, was it? Um, all right yeah okay yeah so so i think that's what this was a um, some a series that i did with chris shelton yeah that's right yeah, yeah that's right um and actually a friend of a friend also had um stumbled upon that and mentioned that so i, I kind of got into some of your work where, where i have been shocked and i i was compelled to look at your work because of the coverage of jw.org because this was something my parents had mentioned a few years ago um in one of their sort of tamer versions to to witness slightly um but mentioned the channel so that's when i thought okay what are they sort of doing i i had a shock watching it because obviously the difference from when i left to <laughs> what i'm looking at now um it's a different um, animal altogether um at least it was <laughs> i don't say at least but it was a covert and a little bit smarter when I was growing up not that smart it couldn't it didn't sort of trick me and a few others but uh, the governing body seemed quite mysterious to me they could mm. be wizards floating about the place and they were easier to respect when they were out of sight weren't they yes yeah uh, I mean, yeah they were, they were very mysterious and mm. you didn't know who they were I think I think one of your um podcasts you've mentioned it was it struck a chord because that's exactly what I thought when I was a kid was mm. you bumped into one and asked them a question they would you know be very strong they, they, you imagine them just kind of floating around the Bethel corridors <laughs> on, on like a, a cloud of wisdom you know and uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah. Let, let me have a millennia to think about that and I'll come back yeah. with a mind-blowing answer for you but yeah but yeah seeing them on this channel in in oversized suits um just quite cheap and it seems to me sometimes a, a freewheeling a little bit um making things up on the spot so i i was shocked at seeing that um on one level it's it made me feel better um in recent years because when my mum and dad were sort of trying to witness or, or people i knew i kind of thought well you know i i, I kind of know what's going on so I'll placate you, but I'm not really going to open any discussion or allow that to open. I've actually found it harder since her passing um, because I, I suppose I find it extremely upsetting that my family can um, believe it. And, and I don't think it's so much some of the teachings. I mean, like paradise and the pandas and um, things sprinting around um, full of love um carnivores you know um just eating salads now and yeah all, all of that's insane but um it's that conditional love thing that that deeply concerns me um and that my family can be that way and i, th I think that caught up with me in the funeral itself um the fact that you know my mum was still desperate for me to come back after all these years um so, so let's talk about the funeral, if you don't mind, because, yeah, I, you know, I've spoken about funerals on the channel. I don't think I've done like any dedicated videos about it, but I have done like voicemails, um, you know, and so I've, I've heard a, a few horror stories by this point, And I have my own stories to tell about um, attending Jehovah's Witness funerals as someone who is awake to the indoctrination and noticing that what should be an event at which someone is remembered and you know and respected and yeah and memorialized um you know the event gets perverted into essentially a celebration of the organization and the religion that they were a part of yeah. and an opportunity to follow their example as jehovah's witnesses yeah. and um I obviously, when I went to my mother's funeral, was a Jehovah's Witness, and it, it, there, there didn't seem to be anything wrong with us at the time because I was a Jehovah's Witness, yeah. and that seemed like the proper thing to do. Although, to be fair, I think the circuit overseer who gave Mum's funeral talk um, did inject quite a lot of her uh, her personal story, or um, it was made more personal so i'm not saying this happens in every case um but what was your experience 
attending your mother's funeral? It was worse than I possibly <laughs> could have predicted. So my wife, um, my, my father-in-law came for a bit of support because um, for the background, the funeral, there was about, I would say, 40 plus people there, non-witnesses. There were six of us. Um, the rest were, were all Jehovah's Witnesses. And it was, yeah, just far worse than... I could imagine. I, I think that's where the shots come is the um, amount of emotional triggers that occurred during it. Things that I thought I wasn't too concerned about, really. I'd moved on from uh, flared up left, right and centre. So I, I, I felt any sense of grief was taken, really, during that funeral. Yeah, it was 30 minutes of um, Bible scriptures, um, preaching, obviously the resurrection. There, there were a couple of things that caused me a lot of confusion I, i've kind of eased up a little bit in, in my thinking on that but um the the elder doing the talk he mentioned um two of the proudest moments in life were being baptized and, and getting married which you know <laughs> i'm thinking okay and and you did have <laughs> three sons but whether she'd passed that on to him I, I really don't know whether he'd interpreted that because i wasn't party to those discussions obviously um, that the the thing that's playing me most, and I hope you don't mind, I've got it in front of me, and I won't show the pictures, but was her choice of song, which I found um, a tremendous shock reading the words. So it's the song was called "Walking in Integrity," uh, which is taken from Psalm twenty six um, in their Bible verse. So that they all obviously got up to sing. That that was a trigger in itself because I'm stood at the front. This is like the bad old days being in the Kingdom Hall where I'm not singing, I'm not playing a part. My father actually used to be a bit of an opera singer before he joined the religion. So he joined it in much uh, later years, uh, I think in his late twenties. But him just singing and hearing that song and his operatic, uh, uh, I don't know, sort of, um, energy pouring his all into it all these these old triggers and anger and bitterness came up while I'm there at my own mum's funeral so that that was quite confusing and then the words itself and I'll just read the one part and, and it did hit me for six um because he announced just before this song that Jehovah is love is how he worded it and then we have the words I, I do not sit with wicked men of lies I hate the company of those who truth despise Jehovah, please don't take away my life with men who take delight in bribery and strife. Um, so I can actually you, think of the melody as you're saying those you, words. You remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. So that song was ringing, and, and and I suppose maybe I obviously the words and things like that I, I hadn't really thought of for a long, long time and didn't remember them. But but to have hate and despise in the song, I, I was that they actually got married to that um, as well, which I found quite shocking to hear really because from my now um new life of, of well, not new life it's been 30 years or whatever i've not been exposed to things like that so when you hear jehovah or oh, god is love and then in the middle of the song is about hating and despising those who effectively don't think the same way as you do or, or believe in the same god but obviously that's me and i thought well hang on i'm i'm, I'm a man of the world um i haven't brought you any strife i've been looking after you both for or committed any bribery? No, yeah, not that I'm aware. I of. assume. I mean, yeah. you know, I don't want to put yeah. words in your mouth. But, I mean, I yeah. did demand money for all the care, but uh, <laughs> yeah. no, no more at all. And and mm. yeah, so I just thought, wow, um, deep down, is that what you you think of of me? Because I don't believe a word of this religion. I, I haven't for many years. But my love is is generally for people. If I have friends or family, things like that, it may not always show itself in the most obvious way, but is unconditional it won't be just based on someone's beliefs and I'd like to think I would help anyone uh in, in trouble or in need of help I think that's one of the few good things I maybe took from the religion um I used to listen to my dad sort of giving counsel to to different people and he was very good and he, and he did generally care for those within the religion and I took that out in later um in in, in my professions really that I did uh, after that to a certain point um so so to hear that uh shocked me it, it was kind of upsetting to um my wife in a, in a sense as well because she was is that what she thinks of me because 
Um, she, she dreamed of having a, a granddaughter and things like that, which, you know, uh, she had. So my wife was really going out of her way to take um, our child down to spend as much time as possible with her before the diagnosis, before the, all that happened. Um, so, yeah, so, so that really um, hit me hard that, that, that A, that, that that was a song as part of the wedding, I suppose, but was also seen as appropriate to, to be sung at the funeral. And to be clear, that they're, talk, they're talking of or celebrating their hatred yeah. of those who do not share the same yeah. idea of what truth is. Yeah. You know? so, and the six yeah. of us sat at the front, <laughs> mm. you know, pulling our collars, like, whoa. Um, mm. There were direct um, statements, I believe, that were made to me um, and my wife and uh, my other... Do you mean actually in the talk? Yeah. Um, right. So, so, you, so just to be clear, you're saying that, that the elder who was giving the talk was weaving into his talk um, wording that was deliberately intended to make you feel uncomfortable. Yeah, I, I think so. And, and it could be my heightened sense. I have to be sort of fair on that. But he said um, one of the comments he made was that Jehovah always came first in my mum's life. She was the most important thing. Uh, to her and and he sort of he he was the most important thing to to sorry i'm just yes sure. yeah. yeah yeah um and it was around that point he he said and if anyone here is conf is confused about the strength of her faith and why she felt that way and why she followed it through to the end they should speak to and then named my father and other brother who are believers they should speak directly to them so i'm thinking well the other 30 plus people um here are all Jehovah's Witnesses so take your pick out of the very few who aren't um exactly yeah 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 so I thought wow you're actually marking me out and witnessing at my own mother's funeral here um that's that is how a marking talk is given isn't it uh, they I, I learned uh, about this from you yeah they, they have a form of shunning called marking <clears throat> where they uh, specifically don't mention any names but they spell out the behavioural attitudes that um, are disagreeable to the congregation and say we wouldn't want to associate with them. So obviously that wasn't, that doesn't describe what you've just said, but it, it's a similar tactic of, um, you know, wording things in such a way that, you know, it can only apply to a certain, you know, yeah. demographic within the audience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um... So yeah, so that, that was said. And actually during um, the song as well, you know, the added layer, and it, it only, it started winding me up during the wake, which I desperately tried to control and keep smaller because I, <laughs> I couldn't face that many witnesses, perhaps selfish, probably not what she wanted. But my father actually is too old to be traveling here, there and everywhere. So he wanted to take the wake back home and keep it small. Um, but at the wake, I saw uh, uncles, uh, an uncle and aunt, cousin. I haven't seen these people for 30 years, actually giving me daggers as I turned because I'm not obviously singing this song. Um, and I'm looking and thinking, yeah, are you for real? Um, and then at the actual wake, didn't actually um, speak to me at all or say sorry for your sort of loss. Um, you were ghosted at the wake of your own mother's funeral. Yeah. At, at my own parents' house, um, and that became a, a mini sort of JW festival, really. I mean, there were around, only around 20 there, still more than I would have liked. Um, mm. Ironically, I brought down a little uh, parasol thing we could put up in the garden. Um, <laughs> it turns out the six non-believers are all sat under that in the shade, um, just the way it turned out, and all the, the JWs are, are mulling around. Um, talking there and and it, it went from a strange sort of um sorry for your loss I, I the brothers were kind of a bit more welcoming bizarrely um sisters I found really quite hostile quite odd I, d I don't quite know what what was behind that whether something was said about me years ago who knows when you say hostile do you mean in their demeanor towards you or their words or yeah demeanor more than anything um mm. Uh, it, it's hard to sum up really. I, I remember making a comment to one of them because they had uh, they brought coffee and tea machines and 
the sisters were milling around serving serving everybody drinks and and things which actually you know in my world that's a bit weird you know because i'd offered to help and stuff and they're like no 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 you don't need to help and i so i just said in the end you're very organized it's you know a good system you've got going here and one sort of said well this is what we do at the congregation david as you will remember when you were growing up and um you know which went through me like a <clears throat> A knife. So I said, "Well, I mean, it was I'm enraged for you. My yeah. my blood, my blood pressure, just went through the roof just yeah. now. So yeah, okay. Yeah. So it hit me. That was the only line I actually managed to get off because you you, you always come away from these things thinking I wish I'd said this or that. I was very mindful if I if I um, react, I will wind myself up. I, I to be to be honest, I mean, you're a, you're a better man than me, David, because I would have reacted." You know, yeah. they would yeah. they would not have gotten away with that. You know, yeah. may, maybe you know in my younger years, but not the way I am now. They they would have been regretting the moment they said that. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, what stopped me, I think, was my father was still, he's always still around, so he was sat mm. in the corner. And I, I, I did think to myself... What stopped you was your concern for other people, <laughs> concern that they clearly that. didn't... Exactly, yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly mm. that. And and actually, I thought I'm going to, if I do something silly here, I will fit the perfect stereotype of, mm. look, he left and he's an animal. Um, mm. You know, he's turned into an animal. So mm. I, I kind of let that quip go. And then I said, I did manage to get something back. That was the only thing I got off that day. So I did say, um, would you like me to help? Um, or is it just the weaker vessels that, that do all of this stuff? Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> so I managed to. Yeah. So the one sort of uh, shirt to one off, uh, the other sister, she laughed and said, oh, uh, we got our own back in the evenings behind closed doors. And I said, yeah, I don't think you do. Um, mm. I said, remember, I did grow up in it, as you reminded me. So I know how it works. So we kind of let left it there. They wouldn't speak to me, go near me after that. Mm. Um and the whole thing sort of dissipated, but you remembered a little bit too much for their liking, it seems. Yes, yeah. it seems so. Yeah, um, and and I think that's what I found during mm. the funeral, the wake. A lot of things I thought I'd probably buried. Um, so many triggers just just hearing the songs, the prayers. That it took me back to being sort of twelve or thirteen years old, and 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 realizing how uh, horribly unhappy I was. And completely depressed to the point of, of throwing up every weekend um and and just to be dragged back to that really um and then be left with this confusion about my family um about my mum who, who she could have been maybe um because she she didn't really know any different um and how they can't sort of see you know that that's not healthy this is not healthy where you are singing and, and talking about hatred and despising people and you are looking forward to genocide and um billions being murdered um it, it just seems so horrendous and it, it seems more horrendous to me now than it ever did um as a youngster really um so uh, yeah so I'm, I'm still kind of there Unfortunately, what I do find is that I am having problems in that I'm having lots of hypothetical conversations at that funeral and wake still, um, wishing I'd said... Also, oh, and, and it's been how long since the, the funeral? So the funeral was uh, July, um, so I think, um, yeah, so it would have been around... I can, actually, I can tell you if I look at the date. Maybe a month um, ago? Yeah, yeah, so it would have been... Um, early to mid July. So um, so a month a month on, you're still playing it over in your mind and having hypothetical, yeah. you know, the convert why. Okay. Constant conversations. Um mm. from the funeral, from the wake with my father and brother. Um, mm. um a, a desire to sort of lay it on the line for them and say, have you looked at this? Have you looked and bomb them with information? I, I don't because I know where that leads and, mm. and how they're briefed and um, I'll be cut off entirely um, from doing that. Um, but my my brother is due to go. He, he will be going at some point and, and our contact will disappear. He just lives in a, in a different side of the, the world, basically. Um, 
when you say he'll he'll go do you mean he's going a long distance away yeah yeah right yeah. so so he basically mm. came back to help with right the care during her mm. her death so his family are all Jehovah's witnesses as well so so we we've gotten very amicably but obviously i'm now reflecting on conversations where i think hang on were you were you witnessing were you trying to sort of find an in there um my wife had actually commented she was starting to find it overwhelming just before my mum's passing with with love bombing essentially from from the family i i wasn't seeing it i guess i was seeing it as an innocent thing because i'm mm. quite clear on what i do believe and don't so there's no threat to me um so that, so yeah there's this desire to have conversations with him um and, and sort of say have you thought about this or that it's up to you what you do with this information but i do think you should think about it but then i'm i'm thinking about the implications for him and his family if a spark goes off um and you know he's, he's a lot older than i so um that will present him with many different challenges um and, and you concerned yeah, about what the reaction will be once this video goes up um yeah um in short but i have got to that point where I have repressed and kept everything quiet out of consideration, really, and, and love for them. Um, but after this whole scenario, it's not a case of revenge, but it's actually, it's not healthy for me um, to keep having these <laughs> imaginary conversations. Um, <clears throat> I don't sleep some nights very well at all, or it's hard to turn off because it's constantly sort of running around. Um, my my only therapy has really been writing and, and putting things down in, into yeah, it's all fiction but it's based a lot on, on how i think or feel about some of these events so uh, i did a short recently about paradise because they preach so much about paradise and actually i thought do you know what i'm going to put that into a story of what if it's real so what if you wake up in paradise what are you actually dealing with um so i start with my character sort of burying mass amounts of corpses in the dust and the heat and there's blood everywhere and thinking this is not what I thought was going to happen sort of thing and you know um then, maybe uh, Vlad the Impaler and Osama Bin Laden will be in your bible study group yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then terrified for thinking that because you would be so yeah. it, you know yeah. where you draw the line with this um mm. stuff so yeah so it, it's very much been um hard to deal with I am actually having to start cancelling as a result good but I, I, I was waiting for an in to say if you're losing sleep and if if you're having flashbacks essentially yeah it's yeah it's a mental yeah. health issue yeah. yeah 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 and it's rapidly mm. turned into that and mm. i think i've always been the type of person because of the way i was i, I kind of left that religion in stealth mode i was physically in for, for a period whilst drifting away mm. i was also trying to fit in with people of the world so so all of the time acting i'm in control i've got it all sort of sussed and i'm fine mm. um, as i'm finding at this point due to the events that have happened i'm, I'm not <laughs> i'm not good yeah. um, in, in terms of uh, there's not much control over those thoughts at the moment um mm. and it's just shocking that this organization or the governing body in particular I think I'm upset that they could leave my mum with those fears um, that she actually could never see any other possibility or reality in life, um, not even for her own sort of son. Um, uh, and, and that actually those people who, who were at the wake were at the funeral, a lot of them aren't, I don't, you know, they're not bad people. I don't think they're, they're inherently bad or anything. They are just so um, indoctrinated that they cannot see how horrendously inappropriate their, their, their behavior is really. Um, mm. And it, it was at a bedside, as I've mentioned before, there were, I'd be sat with her holding her hand and I'd have someone in my ear saying, oh, me and your mum, you know, dreamed that we'd sit on this bench in paradise, we'll have our own bench and look out on our land. And, you know, and I'd be sitting there thinking, I, I can't believe you're, you're sort of saying this. Um, so, yeah, so it, it's those, things that I couldn't say or I held back out of respect um, that uh, are actually causing me some issues now, I find. Mm. 
I do wonder, should I have said something at the funeral or the wake? Um, I do find there are opportunities sometimes to speak to the family when I'm there. Um, the atmosphere I find is extremely strained now more than ever since she passed. Um, there's a giant elephant in the room which is squeezing all um, love or, or joy really out. It's very strained now. Um, and then typically, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> my baby was playing with my dad's sort of Sky remote or whatever else, and all his apps came up and there's jw.org and we're leaving. And then he mentions it, you know, oh yeah, we've got, and I'm thinking, oh, I wish she'd done that an hour ago because <laughs> that would have been a great segue in, but she, it's yeah. just as we're leaving sort of thing. Um, Is it bad that I've got jw.org, uh, the JW <laughs> Broadcasting app on the, uh... On my Apple TV, that's probably well, think, a really bad thing. But I, I use it for work, so yeah, I have yeah, an excuse. Got, yeah, you've got, you've got, I mean, I have watched, um, obviously, through through your um, podcast, some of what they're, mm. they're learning. I think that's the other thing that I found um, deeply concerning. It is causing me some difficulty in terms of, I have no doubt when my baby gets older, my mum was still around, um, it, it, gathering dread that they would have had their eyes on her because um, respect or not for someone else's beliefs, the ends always justifies the means with them. And I, I think she would have been honing in on that. Um, and certainly I get feeling now that maybe my family that are here at the moment have been doing that. Um, naively, I was going to bring her to the funeral. I'm so glad I didn't because... Good choice. Yeah, I, I think I would have done what you'd said at the funeral. I probably would have reacted if I'd seen them passing around like a mm. a, a fleshy wool cup. Um, I think mm. that would have killed me. Um, mm. So I, I'm glad I didn't do that. But that's the other nagging dread is actually as Molly uh, got older, they, they would have been probably after her. Um, they did speak to my wife a lot at the funeral when my back was turned, which... That's something else that's bothered me. Um, I'm guessing the hostility, they, they could see they weren't going to get anywhere with me. I think they found me a bit disconcerting, maybe. Um, my brother certainly does, my oldest brother. I don't think he quite knows how to, to broach it because I've gone off and lived something of a, a mystery life to them. Um, but they certainly said different bits to her, which I, that I found very um, infuriating, to say the least. Mm. Um, one had said to her, oh, um, David's mum thought you were very special. There was something special about you. And um, my wife had said, well, I'm so sorry, you know, that we're not going to spend more time with her now. And, you know, because she really loved her, the baby and everything. And they said, well, you could because we believe. And then boof, off, off they go. I mean, that was my auntie, actually, who said that, who didn't say a word to me personally at all. Um, at the funeral and yeah that's where the complications come in because you think hang on I, I made a choice as a, yeah, a kid that I wasn't going to do this and, you and let, let's just uh, just for the benefit of any Jehovah's Witnesses who might be watching let's just take that kind of hypothetical scenario that you maintain your position as an as an unbeliever and your wife takes um your auntie's your, takes your aunt up on that offer and becomes a Jehovah's Witness. And at Armageddon, um, you are killed and your wife gets to meet your mother, but you're dead. Yeah, yeah, sorry. About and and, and how, how is this something to look forward to? Yeah, you yeah. Know? It's insane, isn't it? And, it's... And, and I'm not even describing the fate of your daughter if she doesn't become a Jehovah's Witness yeah. because it's too enraging. Uh, but I, I, I really, really wish Jehovah's Witnesses would just think about this yeah. and, and, and the permutations of, of, of what they are literally praying for every day. Yeah. Well, interestingly, I had uh, another family member a bit closer and, they, and they, they've been respectful by and large mm. uh, so, so at the wake actually I, I went into my mum's room and sat on the bed um, I, I found myself sort of trying to find some sort of 
reality in there actually i was looking at her clothes and things like that like is this all real is this because <laughs> it was such a uh, an insane day that it was all you know um disintegrating really so she she came in and sat with me and said are you are you okay and i said well, i said not not really i said i found it very difficult with um all the witnesses sort of here um she, she did say what well, do you not believe in god then and i said um i said well it's besides the point i said mm. Imagine I go to your mother's funeral. Um, I said, you're, you're full of grief, you're mourning, it's, it's a terrible time for you. And I'm in your ear saying, have you thought about the virtues of atheism? Mm. And I keep talking to you relentlessly all day long about there is no God, there is no heaven or hell, there's nothing. Um, you don't need to worry mm. as far as I know. Um, and I just said that all day. There's no afterlife. and it, yeah, yeah, there's nothing. Mm. Anything you believe is rubbish. So... Mm. Get it, and and I think she'd look kind of shocked at that. Although I will say, after a few minutes, she did say, "So, do you not believe in God then?" And I thought, well, that's, not, "That's not the chief concern here." Um, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so so I I think in some way that may have struck some sort of chord in there. That that you know, I would never dream of pushing anything on someone at such a a, a terrible time, really, for someone. Mm. Um, it's yeah it's just completely inappropriate it, it shouldn't even need explaining to someone but yes they're that far gone um i think they obviously believe that this really is to save your life but as you say at what cost if if you're splitting families up or mm. um and that's something i again i had to observe as a youngster was my family split because of um a couple of choices uh, of, mm to people who didn't believe and, and what they'll sometimes say of course is oh yeah okay so maybe there'll be people who don't get um who get destroyed maybe there'll be people who get destroyed as armageddon who we care about but god's going to kind of wave this magic wand so that we don't care about them anymore and we don't love them anymore yeah. to which my answer <laughs> is well what you're doing is changing that person so that they're no longer that person because we are defined by our feelings and our emotions and especially our relationships with other people yeah. so if god's just going to kind of get the toolkit out and and work on our our brain configuration and stop us from caring about people who we intensely care about he is effectively changing who we are and whoever it is that's in the paradise pretending to be us is not us you know yeah it's not happening mm. some yeah, it's a sort of invasion of the body snatchers. <laughs> You've yeah. lifted and dropped it into, into this sort of paradise. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. It's, um, yeah, pretty awful. And, and I think I think I think that's the thing I found difficult is I left that religion with utter, utter conviction, even though I was young, knew knew exactly what I felt, who I was. There was a lot of rage um around it um so for all these years on um and they still don't understand it or see any possibilities and i had, I had very um detailed conversations with my my mum even and like i said she mentioned covid a couple of years ago and started on the phone we were talking and she sort of said well, what do you what do you believe and i don't understand she got quite sort of frustrated um witnessing and i said well i said i i, I said i, I I prefer scientific sort of theories. I said, I do believe in the theory of, of evolution. I checked myself and said, not evolution that you, that you believe in. I said, I, I know what you believe in, or the, the, the sort of, it's like a crayon version of, of um, evolution in terms of what they've been taught. So I said, actual real evolution. Um, I said that, that that for me is a, is a pretty decent theory. And she's, you know, it was the usual conversation actually, because she said, well, there's holes in, I said, of course there is. I said, but what I don't do is fill those holes with, well, God did it then. Mm. Said, that, that's not good enough for me. So I said, I respect your faith. That's what you want to believe. And that's fine. But for me, it's it's never been realistic. It seems incredibly far-fetched. Um, the idea that I would allow eight people to govern me from afar and make all my life choices and decisions right till I die is, is insane to me. Um, I did proffer up what if they've been misinformed have you considered that um so if satan and his demons are whispering in our ears and convincing people to do this and that what if they got to the governing body what if you're listening to the wrong 
eight people. Um, I think, I, to be honest, I think in your shoes, I would say, just look at them and tell me, look me in the eyes, look at them and <clears> look <throat> me in the eyes and say, out of all of the billions of people living on the planet, these are the eight people that God has chosen to communicate on his behalf. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> Look at Stephen Letts and yeah, Tony he Morris. Up, he came up two weeks ago. Um, mm. I, and that, that's the, that's that's one of the recent tragedies of this because it was when the, the app came up, so when my baby was playing with it, and my dad said, oh, we have this this JW.org, and um, he said, you know, it's it's really good. And I, I said, well, I said, I have seen, um, I said, I've seen that wacky character on there. He said, he looks like a Play-Doh sort of character, with big, crazy eyes. Giant suit, and um, they were looking. I said, Let's. So I was playing a bit dumb. I sort of said, You know, is it Let's, Stephen Let's, and like that? And I said, He talks in a, an incredibly patronizing manner. Um, mm. and, they, and, and doesn't so, like children. It, no, hate, <laughs> yeah, hate children. They yeah. are the enemies of, of God. Mm. Um, so he uh, he said, Oh, he's my favorite one. So that, oh. that was like, Oh, God. I mean, he, he's a lot older and, and he's not quite cognitively there sometimes i don't think mm. so so th that that makes me feel quite sad that he wouldn't i i think he would have seen that for what it was mm. 10 15 years ago now well you, you say that but i i think when you're in it and you, you desperately want it to be true you find reasons for it to be somehow endearing yeah i well, can imagine jehovah's witnesses do genuinely think that Stephen lets a compelling speaker i can i can really imagine that because that that they have to <laughs> they have to find yeah, yeah. it compelling you know the whole thing falls apart doesn't it and, mm, yeah uh, actually my brother my old brother said um he said oh he talks that way because his parents were um deaf and dumb no not true yeah well i i, yeah. I, I, I didn't even have to think about that but it was the mm. fact i thought because obviously i've got a lot of blanks in all of this but i thought mm. Hang on, he he's so aware that he's coming across as a lunatic. He had to tell them, I may come across as a lunatic, but it was because of I, I've literally interviewed his niece and she's yeah, confirmed watched. that it's a it's um basically a persona that he puts on. And you can also see when he's speaking to an audience <laughs> that he thinks is just Bethelites, he tones it down a bit. So yeah. 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 Um I, I mean I found that a bit quite amusing, but at the same time infuriating because mm. um, mm. he's a younger man uh, than my father of course and, and I just mm. thought oh, man, like think about what you're sort of saying and why they'd need to tell you this stuff in the first place um, mm. clearly they've picked up that I sound like a lunatic so I need to brief them why I may sound like that but um, mm. so yeah so I think it's it's the whole it's it's you know as you know it's it's it becomes more and more complex I find um, mm. now that I've fallen into it um, well, you know, due to events. Um, yeah. And I just well, find it crazy. I suppose the teachings were, didn't convince me as a child. I, I knew, I think I was fortunate. I don't think others had that. I, I don't really know why I felt so clear on it so young. I, I can't tell you. I think it was the lifestyle that made me deeply unhappy to the point it had a physical effect. Mm. So that was enough for me. And then obviously as I matured anyway, I, I, I analysed what they were teaching and I just thought it can't be true because it's so insane um when you actually think about what it means in real terms it, it doesn't it doesn't work on any level um but now 30 years on it seems you know um crazier than it's ever been to me um and i find it horrendous i know if i have a direct conversation uh just by doing this anyway i'll probably be branded an apostate i imagine some of my my works of fiction then no, i've only got a few published pieces here and there on a website that kind of thing that that would be seen as um some of it as apostate literature i'm sure um because some of it's taken from real events or mm. uh, my novel would would i be able to put the links in the description yeah that's fine yeah okay that's, okay um, that's fine can't hurt can no, it? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah the traffic in there that's great yeah um yeah, um, and, and yeah, they're, they're, they're short stories, a lot of them. I do have a novel in the works. I've It's mm. done. I'm, I'm going through editorials. Mm. Um, it's very boring. I have to rewrite the first six chapters, basically. But I, I based it hugely on um, my experiences as a child. 
mm. the, the beliefs themselves have fictionalized the name of the religion um out of respect but it's it's analyzing in a, in a really extreme where hover's jitness is <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i don't know what you mean it just happened to rhyme and yeah yeah a couple of letters difference um no I, i've given them a cheeky title they're called matthew's mm. prophets um okay that i've called this lot um, and that, that was based on the verse that I had drummed into me, um, Matthew 24, 14, um, on how they work. But I, I suppose it's looking at an extreme view in a fictional sense, but in a very real sense that what would you be willing to pay? What's your price to actually see these things fulfilled? Um, mm. If it were true, um, mm. as it happens, I have a very malicious character in it, um, a supernatural character. Um, that is deceiving them um, into mm. a paradise that's going to be far from a paradise. But actually, if you analyze it in real terms, what, what you dream of as a paradise, what you think is going to be something wonderful, is, is it's quite disturbing. Um, it's not a healthy thing. And how many people are you going to lose along the way? Um, and to keep branding everybody as apostates or um, anti-JWs, that kind of thing, um, just for really thinking about things for themselves and being quite reasoned. Um, um, it's it's a pretty hollow existence. Um, it is. And I, I think, hopefully, hopefully I'm not going on too long, sorry Lloyd, but I, I even noticed that the, the wake itself, people a bit older than me, I hadn't seen them for, you know, 30 years or whatever, they all in some way looked even hollower than when I was growing up. It was quite an unpleasant sight. They, they I think were... I think part of that, to be honest, is just getting older. It's, it's yeah, kind of de yeah, depressing, little... isn't it, when you see people deteriorate in front of you because you've been around so long yourself, you know, and then yeah. you see yourself deteriorating. It's like, oh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, um, and I think mm. it was the fear as well. They, they did seem... Mm generally quite scared of, of me uh, mm. which I found odd I just thought what do you think I've been doing well fear fear isn't good for your heart is it and uh no. if your heart's not healthy it's going to show in your in your kind of overall health so yeah 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 exactly that um so yeah so it's been uh yeah a pretty um remarkable time but I would say for anybody who left years ago or under whatever circumstances if they're going to come back because of an event like this, um, it's, I, I think it's impossible to prepare for um, because of how you feel emotionally. You can't cater for once you're there. I think there are some triggers and, and impacts you won't see coming. Um, but mm. the one thing I, I am trying to pull out of this is I am sane, actually, and did make the right decision all of those years ago. And seeing what they've been up to the last few years is only sort of underline that i think the great sorrow is for any jehovah's witnesses listening to this is don't lose your family don't lose your loved ones over these beliefs because love should always be unconditional um I, there's nothing in the bible that i can see that suggests love is purely conditional and based on beliefs um alone mm. um and don't lose the people that matter because you know if, if there is some sort of afterlife or something, I imagine if you're floating around up there, you, you'll probably be thinking, what was I doing? Um, was it worth it, the price I've paid? Um, so I hope people do sort of think about that seriously um, and don't just see the word apostate and run a mile because under that, there's a lot of good people I'm finding, um, mm. yourself included. The work that goes on out there, the support for people is amazing and um, I just hope people can find that. Very well said. What you've done is you've preemptively answered the the question that I typically <laughs> ask uh, my interview subjects, which is what would be your message to um, lurking Jehovah's Witnesses um, or those who hold a candle to Jehovah's Witness beliefs who might be watching? And I, you know, I'm not going to ask that question again because I think what you've just said is beautiful and and very very um insightful and something for jehovah's witnesses to think about i do have two more questions yeah um the first question being you know you've shared this traumatic experience with us and i'm sure you know i'm not the only one uh, listening to this story whose blood will have been boiling and who 
uh, will feel incensed at the way you were treated at such a delicate moment in your life. Um, moving forward, you know, you, you've mentioned counselling. Presumably, you have your wife to support you. Um, do you see a silver lining in terms of uh, finding closure from your mother's death? I do in some respects, yeah. I think, I think away from my mother, I have, I have a baby and I actually found during her rather slow, agonizing death, um, that coming away from that environment, coming home to my baby, they, they, they just snap you out instantly anyway. They just evoke reactions and just faces that are pulling or crying, whatever's going on, you, you, you're kind of with your baby. So, so that's always helped, and that's my target. Actually, is I can I will not allow this to ruin any time I have left because I have something very precious to um, to look after, and I don't want any echoes or overlaps or a shadow hanging over her from this that affects my my mood. Um, so I do see some positivity in terms of um, dealing with it once and for all. I think um, I think I buried so much um hadn't felt triggers for a long long time um so now I, i'm dealing with those sort of front on mm. um i think with my mum deep down i know she was inherently a, a, a good person i think and I, I i see her as a i need to see her as a victim actually i think of, of this organization she was brought up in it since she was nine she died age 73 74 she's got no other or had no other frame of reference on how to live. Um, but there were moments growing up in later life as well, where I, she, I, I used to say very inappropriate jokes, um, subtle, but but inappropriate all the same, or a bit, and she, I'd catch her laughing or smiling, or so I knew there was a dark humor in there. Um, and I knew there was a, a a bit of fire deep down. Um, I just think it had been doused somewhat by some unhealthy uh, teachings. Yeah. Um, and it's those memories I'm trying to click on to more. That was her. That that's that's the mother you need to remember. I think. Yeah. 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 And I think you you mentioned a story um, with your mum and something you picked up in a in a teaching. Um, mm. I think it was. It was in a book study where she uh, she dared to question the book study conductor who was my dad <laughs> right. um, yeah. over something yeah. that I'd pointed out to her previously. Yeah. I was in the room when you said yeah. that. I, I absolutely yeah. sort of pictured it. But um and yeah, so the fact you you took something like that, and I think I, I get the same that she mm. um she did have these other moments to her. Um mm. and, and that's what the religion does. I think it, it does repress people. It's make it makes them very fearful of their own thoughts. Um so they, they sort of crushed them down. But there were moments with her um, where she could see it. And she, she did actually say one day that it, uh, years ago, that she can see it took a lot of courage to do what I did. Um, and she did admire that in a way. Um, so that was nice to hear, I think. Um, Always cherish that. Don't yeah. let anyone take that from you. Yeah. 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 And I love what you, you were saying as well about... Um, your children and uh, you know your child and the fact that just looking at your child made you kind of snap out of um, you know your uh, darker thoughts and I, I completely relate to that and um, I actually think that there's poetry in a way in the way the next generation kind of carries on the baton and gets an opportunity to improve on perhaps some mistakes made by the previous generation so yeah. with my two girls i have jessica whose name is jessica liberty and, and you know you right. probably have seen my videos with her but she she's a very clever girl and yeah. she has got her head her head screwed on and she understands what the liberty in her name means and that she's basically almost the custodian of of liberty um for the next generation you know yeah. and and also um julia who's the three-year-old uh her name is uh julia leslie leslie being the name of my mother and what's really how can i put it 
um what what's really beautiful is that she looks like mom it's it's kind of it's kind of um weird in a way that when i look at her i'm i can i and i've obviously seen photographs of what mum looked like when she was a similar age and she she's just the spitting image of my mother so there's almost like um a circle of life element to things and the, the fact that you know death is inevitable it's it's coming for all of us no there are no exemptions but um, there's also life and and in a way you you need the death to make way for the life you know yeah. I can I can I've actually done this mental exercise where I figured out that if mum had stayed living as much as I you know want her to still be around it's very very unlikely that um I would have um that Jessica and Julia would have been born basically yeah um that's and, and and life's just like that that's just how life is it, it's it, it does its own thing when it comes to this to this cycle um but it's beautiful that um in both jessica and julia i have 25 percent mum you know yeah. Yeah. and 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 they get the chance to not make the mistakes that the previous generation made yeah you know? yeah mm. it is a beautiful thing i think isn't it and mm. And it's also the moments, I think, that that's what I've learned from this. Um, uh, I've had a, a horrendous fear. Like every, every human has, I think, a fear of death. But I mm. think that's not helped by a religion like this. Mm. You are treading it from a very early age. And, and then you're told, actually, don't worry, you're not going to die. I think it dawned on me in my late 20s, even though I'd left a long time ago, I'm going to die. I started sort of having a terror. It haunted every sort of day quite a period but actually now i've been there witness excuse the pun but witnessed the kind of thing um directly seeing it happen all, all it's actually done is is reminded me that it's it's all about moments every and it sounds a cliche it sounds like a postcard but it really is it's every moment i get with my daughter my wife with loved ones whatever it's it's making the most of those um and realizing them when they're there sometimes you don't know it's a big moment till after but then you can reflect on it properly and and do it that way and not live in this eternal fear of and, and that's where i feel quite bad for mm. Jehovah's witnesses as well it's if it's not jehovah it's satan watching you it's the demons it's it's this constant uh, madness running around watching you all the time um whilst desperately trying to have eternal life that seems very cruel in its own way mm. um whilst you're doing all that you are losing all of these moments with your loved ones so um yeah that that's my that's my plan at least to um to see that through and good for you enjoy what's left yeah and my final question um you've already said what your message would be to uh, any jehovah's witnesses watching now let's zero in on a certain group of jehovah's witnesses um what would you say to any family members who are uh, Jehovah's Witnesses who may stumble on our conversation? My love is is unconditional. I think it will always be unconditional. Um, I think the religion is uh, a wedge for love. It, it suppresses what people wish to say and what they may want to say to me in real terms. Um, and that if if it's the truth and you truly believe it's the truth, then it will always stand up to any sort of investigation or scrutiny. So don't be afraid to go and do exactly that and do it from any source that you desire or need or want to look at. It should not only ever be from the uh, governing body or their publications, because if it's the truth, it'll, it'll stand up. It's, it's really that simple. Um, you should never be castigated or made to feel you're an apostate for even thinking about looking at this other stuff just go and look at it because you owe yourselves that um you owe your loved ones that and um it's it's a very healthy thing to do um it's a very hard thing to do if you don't like what you read necessarily or it comes as a shock um but sometimes the truth the real truth can be quite difficult to um digest but it's it is digestible ultimately um so yeah, that, it that. tastes great. Yes, <laughs> yeah, and once yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, once you've got that freedom. It tastes way better than watermelons, I can tell you. Or, sm <laughs> yeah. or smoothies, that's the latest one. Yeah. Uh, well, everyone can... in paradise gets a smoothie now. I mean, they never would have heard it if I can I'd finish it with the story of... Um, <laughs> I just caught on with you, smoothie. Um, when I was, I think, around 14, 15, I, I'd be not going to the meetings. I'd be pretending I was ill, that kind of thing. I can remember very vividly, and my, I don't know if my dad and, and brother will remember this, but it was Sunday morning, it was time for me to get up to go to the meeting. And I was not getting up from that bed. And I remember my mum saying, come on, you're not, you're not unwell again. And I just said, it's nothing to do with me not being well. I'm not going again, ever again. I cannot do this. And I remember getting her very, she got very upset, obviously disappeared, ran down the stairs. But I can honestly say, I will never, ever have that feeling again of complete and utter, I, I can only call it el elation. I could breathe and I didn't know that I couldn't breathe before. Mm. I didn't know there was even a problem. But once it's been said at such a young age, um, I'll never have that euphoric <laughs> feeling again because I knew I'd stumbled upon an absolute truth. Um, mm. I'd been honest to myself. And yeah, it was incredibly freeing. So through all of the fear, once it was said, once it was out, uh, um, that is the biggest high I've ever had in my life. Um, so pursue the high, I would say, um, and see where you get. Beautiful, beautiful way to end. David De Winter, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. You are an inspiration. Oh, uh, I you, really man. do empathise with what you've been through, but uh, I have a feeling you've got this. And I... Look forward to catching up again at some point in the future and yeah, me too. seeing your progress. And and just finally, thank you for all your incredible work over the years. I was late on to it, but I'm so glad it's out there because um, sometimes people just need to know they're not going mad. Um, mm. And you do that in a wonderful way. So, um, yeah, thank you too. Thank you. Thank you. Viewers, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. I have thoroughly enjoyed connecting with David. Don't forget that you can enjoy similar videos to this by subscribing to the Lloyd Evans channel, but that's all we have time for. Thank you so much for watching.